Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are looking at Samurai Cop from 1991. Um, so today, once again, I am joined by guest Jake Fleming. So, Hello there. Yeah, hi Jake. <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, so how, how are you doing today? I'm alright, yeah, I enjoyed uh, another masterpiece, Yeah, obviously. We've just watched Samurai Cop, and we've got lots of thoughts on it, but yeah, uh, a great movie again, so thank you for thank picking you. me for this absolute oscar worthy 10 out of 10 10 out of 10 yeah we don't even need to do the podcast 10 out of 10 let's go (laughs) okay so before we start i've just got a few uh little facts yeah let's do it so you may remember at the end i was saying i was really confused by like the way the film had been filmed yes yeah there was something i was noticing while watching this well i had noticed it previously because i've seen this film a few times uh for reference this is a film i actually saw when i was very young and realizing that it probably wasn't suitable for me for my age, because uh, I was like 10 when I saw this first. Yeah, that was surprising to me. But what I liked is that you said that you didn't see it as a bad movie back then, which I guess you wouldn't because you're 10 years old. So you no. wouldn't necessarily see all of these little foibles as things. That I, I was seeing a character with a samurai sword and yeah. violence. Yeah, and you enjoyed that aspect of it, presumably. Yeah, well, it's like, I, I don't know if I've said before on, on podcasts, but like... um. One of the things I look back on when I was, you know, when I was younger, and I go, oh, oh God, kind of thing. Yeah. Was um, the day I found out that films weren't real. Okay. And um, I, I thought they were real. They weren't actors, and just being utterly disappointed that James Bond genuinely wasn't murdering oh. people. <laughs> yeah, that's quite sad in a way. I thought you were going to say just James Bond wasn't real in general, but murdering people. Yeah, that's, no, even, no. that's even more tragic. Yeah. God, sad times. Sad times. <laughs> anyway, let's the facts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, basically, the, the filming wrapped up. Then, um, seven months later, Matthew Cadera, see, I think that's how you say his name? Car- uh, Caredes, I think his name is? Matthew Car- sure, Car- Caredes. Sure, yeah. 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 Um, he basically cut his hair very short. Bear in mind, this was seven months later after filming had wrapped. Yeah, yeah. The director then called him back to do some more <laughs> filming. And was furious when he found out he cut his hair. <laughs> As such, you may have noticed throughout the film, he was wearing a pretty poor wig for a long time. Yes, day. yes. Uh, and I think, I mean, I reckon I could point out those scenes, I think, if I had to go through the movie again. I'm pretty sure I could spot the scenes where the, the wig is on. Do you know the thing, the reason I'm confused, though? Yeah. Right, you know that last fight you had with the big guy? Yes. He was wearing the wig in that scene. Yeah. So presumably that was filmed seven months later. So how else... Yeah, that's true, because that's right at the end of the movie. Yeah. How did the movie end before that? Did they not have one? Did they have a fight? That's yeah, what I want to know. I don't know. Like, I'm sort of intrigued to go back and see if, like, maybe all of the scenes where they interact, maybe he's wearing a wig and maybe they added a character or something like that. Oh. I don't know, but I can't think how you could possibly, like have this big, like, lapse of logic where you go, oh, we don't need to kill off this guy we've been building to this whole time. Well, that's, I mean, is he's too integral to the story. I don't think it's possible for him not to have been included. I think you're right. They might have just forgotten to kill him. <laughs> I think they should have forgot. Are they, because, again, not jumping ahead, but it does happen at a strange moment in the movie, doesn't it? Yes. To the point where you could see that they may have just forgotten about him. Yeah, I also love the fact that, not in that fight, probably in that fight, realistically, but also the fight before it, you see the, the wig come off at one point. <laughs> yeah, you did point that out when it happened. I missed it. I must have looked down for a second, but I missed the wig coming off, but that is funny. Okay, that's fact. Almost every shot in this film was done in a single take. This was done to cut costs, as they wanted to use every inch of reel effectively. Yeah, okay. I noticed a couple of times that the actors flubbed their lines, mm. not in a way that was like really bad, but they might just stumble over a word and do it again. And normally you'd retake that, presumably. Yeah, yeah. They obviously didn't. So yeah, I did feel like they must just be using one take each time. So that does make sense. And also you mentioned something as well, because when we were looking at it, the film started and it kind of had that effect of film. Yes. And I thought that might be fake, but you're saying that's because... It literally was the only film they had in a canister to use, right? Yeah. Also, I I don't entirely know. I think there's some where they like accidentally put like uh, thumb prints and stuff on it and stuff, uh, and you okay. can sort of see like uh, see it in the film, and they just didn't get rid of it. Wow. They wanted to use it all. 
Like, even when it comes down to, like, the cars, the houses, the clothing used in this film, it's all from the actors. Oh, wow. Gosh. Yeah. Okay. So, shoestring budget. That was, this one. Yeah. Gosh. All right. Okay. So, do you remember how I was saying there were a few facts in this one that were quite similar to Manos Hands of Fate? Yeah. Yeah, you did say that. Yeah. So, you remember how that film was shot using a silent camera and then kind of, like, dubbed over later? Yeah. Yep. Well, you're never going to guess it. Uh, oh, wait. The director shot a lot of this film without sound. <laughs> the lines were dubbed in later. Now, you remember how, like, the film started? They had one of the Japanese characters talking. Yeah, yeah. And I started cr- cringing and going, oh, no. Yes. Um, that's because the director... Yep. Uh, he basically did a lot of... The, basically, a lot of the people weren't available to redub over their own lines. So sure. he did it. And then he basically just um, warped his voice in post-production. Yes. And, yeah, so a lot of those gang members were just him putting on an accent. It's very awkward in the sense that, obviously, a lot of those gang members are... There's a lot of Asian members of this gang, yeah. right? So the trouble is, he's got to do an Asian voice mm. or a voice that overdubs the Asian character. That's an extremely awkward thing to be doing. There was one particular character about halfway through in the restaurant, I think, is the most noticeable. Yes. A very over-the-top performance. Um, that one was really awkward. That uh, one was, yeah, lots of offensive nature going on there, I think. Hadn't aged. No, no. <laughs> so, this next fact's actually pretty interesting, to be honest. Yeah. In, in a non-ironic way. Yeah. So, Matthew uh, Caredes, um, I'm pretty sure I'm saying his second name wrong differently every time. So, um, the Samurai Cup. Yes. He had formerly been the bodyguard of Sylvester Stallone. Oh, do you know what's funny? A couple of times, Mm. I thought he sort of looks and acts a bit like Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. It's actually because of Sylvester Stallone he got into acting. Right. Um, I believe it was around about Rambo 3 he was shooting that. He was his bodyguard. Yeah, yeah. And um, there was a particular point where he he, he basically thought, if I could have 1% of what Sylvester Stallone has... Yes, yeah. No, I did... Th- I, it's it's about the way he delivers his lines, and also he looks a bit Rambo-ish at times. Yeah. Well. So, yeah, that's interesting, and that does make sense. I wouldn't have su- suspected that there was an actual connection between the two. I thought he was very inspired by him, but... Yeah. Okay, all right. Last, look, last fact, and to be honest with you, this one goes a bit in a, a leap, but I actually think it's sort of sweet in a way. Yes. So, again, we're talking about Matthew R. Um, Carades. Yes, so. yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, following the release of the film, Matthew went quiet for many years, basically he didn't get any other roles. Yeah. As such, rumours began to circle that he had died. Right. Um, until he came forward and revealed he was still alive, and he'd actually been very unaware of this film's cult status until then. Wow. As such, he basically got like a crowdfunding thing going up, and a sequel was actually made for this film in 2015 from it. Gosh. And now, I did know that there was a Samurai Cop too. I will say that much. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is something that you've, you've, you have shaking seen, your head at me. Seen it. So, the first Samurai Cop, you know, the, the one we're currently watching, I'd say is in the so bad that it's good region. Right. Samurai Cop 2, it's aware it's bad, and yeah. it's, it's, unwatchable to be quite frank in my opinion i was sad because i was rooting for it but it's also got tommy Wilson in it oh yes yes i did know that actually yeah yeah i was aware of that actually one of the few funny scenes is at the end where they're doing the big fight because he's a bad guy to we will sell of course yeah and he's just doing this long speech that goes on for about 10 minutes <laughs> and it's nonsense you can tell he's just ab-libbing and yeah. he's so intense in it but in all the wrong way it's fantastic oh what brilliant yes. oh that's fantastic i would say don't watch the film watch that watch scene. that scene yeah. yeah oh absolutely yeah anything that's you know a bit of extra tommy i'm, I'm all for mm. you know he's my man so yeah. yeah absolutely anyway after that let's say quite long introduction i'm going to do my dramatic intro okay and then we shall get on with looking over the film right you are the leader of an evil drug smuggling katana gang. It feels as if you have the world at your fingertips. Not only are you raking in more money than you could have ever wanted, but you have a very beautiful girlfriend. However, little do you realize that soon it will crumble. One by one, your gang is being picked off 
by a sword-wielding cop. Worse still, he even manages to steal your girlfriend. Your fury grows, and you plot your revenge. Soon, you will come face to face with the samurai cop. That was good. That was that. It was more enthralling than the movie. I, <laughs> I would say. Thank you. I enjoyed that. <laughs> right onto the film. Okay. Where do we start? I mean, we start with the kind of gang, I suppose, the Fujiyama, Mr. Fujiyama. Mm-hmm. Um, and at this point, they're sort of making some dealings. I guess they come across some other gang that doesn't want to be a part of their gang, so they beat them up. They beat them up. There's a big fight. Yep. Yeah, I mean... Well, it's pretty pointless. I mean, it just establishes this gang, doesn't it? That's all that, that happens, really, at this moment in time. We're quickly moved away from this, and we go straight into Here Is Our Hero, Samurai Cop, mm. uh, and his buddy, Frank Washington. I guess these are the two guys that are our protagonist. Yeah, and the thing I love about this is I think like there's some point where the, the fake wig is very overt, but yeah. this seems probably one of the ones that's up there. So me- meaning the very first and last scene of the film, he's wearing a wig. I didn't actually notice at the time we were watching this because it's too early on and I haven't mm. established a feel for his real hair. Yeah. But now we have it on screen again, I can see, yeah, it's really obvious. It's funny, at first I sort of looked at him and I thought, he's kind of... Like a mix between Tommy Wiseau and <laughs> Greg Sestero. Because he's got those sort of handsome features yeah. of Greg Sestero. But the, the hair and the slight sort of weird muscly squatness mm. of Tommy Wiseau. Um, so he's a jarring looking character. But in the context of this movie, he is irresistible to all women. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously very very attractive i'd have to ask a woman i suppose <laughs> to, to know if that was the case but yeah maybe maybe a, a woman from the early 90s so yeah. yeah that's probably fair isn't it maybe that was the style at the time but the other thing i noticed with him is he doesn't wear a police uniform he doesn't seem to have to he's too cool yeah i guess he's too cool i mean he wears like a leather jacket and jeans and no one seems bothered by it no no But basically, our two heroes, um, Samurai Cop and Frank, are sort of hiding on the streets, waiting for the Katana gang to show up, as there there are rumours of a drug deal going down. Yes, yeah. Meanwhile, there are two other police officers, uh, Peggy, and I think the other man is unnamed, but he's basically the pilot. They're in the sky in a helicopter. So this goes on for a while, doesn't it? This sort of... Helicopter doesn't do anything. No, that's what I was about to say. Like, I don't really. They they want to have them to scout out the the the, the kind of the deal. Yes, but there's no real correlation between them seeing them and then. No, they see the deal happen. The people that take the drugs off of the gang just leave. Yeah, they don't seem to be worried about where those drugs are going. They're going after the supplier, but. It's not like it was a small amount of drugs. It wasn't a drug de- like a small drug deal, was it? It was four or five bags of drugs that they passed over. I I I love watching this scene because it doesn't make any sense. Like the the drug dealers pass a suitcase over, and then the other people pass them a suitcase back. Okay, you know you think fine, that's you know them doing the deal, and then the drug dealers pass another suitcase over. And the other people pass another one back. What's happening? What is happening here? <laughs> like, but but like you say, they do all that in kind of view of every everyone involved in this chase. The helicopter can see this going on. Briefly, uh, Joe and Frank get out of the car to look at the deal, mm. and then they drive off and they chase them down in their car. So there's, there isn't really any point of them viewing all that taking place. They just kind of see it. Yeah. And then the chase begins afterwards. As I say, the helicopter does nothing. No. It just stays out of it the whole time. Um, Once we do get into the chase scene, we start getting some gunfight going on. and Shoot them! Yeah, yeah, that's a nice... I don't know if that's a repeated sound clip. Is it the same? I think it must be, surely. Either that or he performs it almost identical (laughs) twice, uh, which is funny. And um, this is quite a thing throughout the movie. Uh, Samurai cop doesn't ever react to a bullet. No. And more so than sort of a, if a bug hits your windscreen, he kind of moves his head slightly when he's being shot at, and that's about it. 
Again, I, I, I know why that is. Yeah, yeah, why? why He's a samurai. He's, no. he, you know, he can dodge bullets, I guess. I, I think my favourite part of this is, shoot him, shoot him now. You know, uh, then Frank shoots one of the drug dealers and they tumble out onto the road. And then Samurai Cop just goes, Ah, you got him. <laughs> so th- at this point, it was it was setting the expectation for me. You've obviously seen this a few times, but I, I wasn't really sure what to expect. The two actors for Samurai Cop and Frank delivering every line at the same monotonous level <laughs> gave me an idea that this isn't going to be a piece of high art. No, no. One day I'll get you on for something like that. I can't wait. Yeah, I'll look forward to that day. Are we talking about Godzilla? Godzilla was high up. That yeah, was great. Yeah. It's good fun. Uh, in, in fairness, even when I was having Ollie on uh, the, the show, I got him to watch Dial of Destiny. I'd say that was a... Uh, I was thinking about that, actually. I think you should do another Dial of Destiny episode in like a couple of years because your feelings might change. Actually, that's one of my plans, uh, you know, along with a historical accuracy section as well. Is that right? I think that would be good. I would like to know in retrospect, because you come out of the cinema kind of hot, don't you? And I had the same thing with uh, Kingdom Crystal Skull. I, even to the point where I bought the DVD in that, I've seen that a few times. I don't, well, I don't hate the film. It's sure. not my favourite. No, that's fair enough. I'd just be interested to know if Dial of Destiny has some sort of arc for you. Maybe you absolutely love it in a couple of years. Maybe it'll be your favourite Indiana Jones. I highly <laughs> doubt that. I don't think it's ever going to be my favourite. You can't be no. the, the first three. Probably not. Um, anyway, so back to the scene. They continue to chase the van with the drug dealers. They shoot another one who falls onto the road and <laughs> they promptly run him over. Yeah, that bit's good, isn't it? When he sort of drives towards him and then you just see him behind the car with a bit of blood on him. Yeah. There's yeah. no, again, no impact or anything like that. He's just been run over. You have to take their word for it, I suppose. Mm. Um, and then, like, they shoot another one. He falls out. Yep. Yep. But I think the best part is uh, the last one where they, what, like, shoot a load of bullets into the van. Yeah. It crashes. Yeah. The van goes up in fire. I mean, he didn't even really crash, did he? Sort of, he bumped into a hill. Mm. And I don't know if the implication is that caused the fire or because they shot the van a lot, it caught fire. You know, like in in GTA. Why does that keep coming up when we talk? (laughs) That's for every episode we mention GTA somewhere. Um, But yeah, it just bursts into flames. And then he's on fire and they... They put him out with a blanket they have. I guess they have a fire blanket. You never know when it's coming in handy. Kind of reminds me when I was younger. We had this car. This is going to sound insane, but I'm being okay. completely and honestly true. I don't know if I've ever told you this before, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, growing up, we had a car that we called Pondwater. Right. <laughs> um, the reason we called it that was because the back foot wells were, you know, a bit squelchy because they were essentially damp. Yeah. And <laughs> in the front foot well... I'm not even kidding. There were some beginnings of an apple tree growing. <laughs> what? You weren't driving this car around. No, no. Oh, yes. I was I was probably like um, eight. So, of course, I was oh, like, okay, yeah. no, I'm driving it. But one day, basically, the brake stopped. Uh, my mum, she went forward to see she bumped into the car from. Yeah. And when I say bumped, I mean like it was, you know, at like three miles an hour. Right. The crash here where it crashes into that. That'd be like my mum bumping into that car. I don't <laughs> just bursting into flames. <laughs> I mean, there was a tree growing out of it. That wouldn't be the weirdest thing happening with the car. That I was going to say it would, because it was damp. It's not going to go on uh, fire. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. It's guess- <laughs> a very good point. <laughs> I was in a tree growing out of the car. <laughs> it's a hazy memory, but I have actually gotten confirmation that that is true. <laughs> That's good. I like it when you have to question something so weird in your childhood. You have to question whether yeah. or not it happened for real. <laughs> oh, I, I absolutely loved the um, loved the car when I was younger. Like, what bit? Mm, yeah, I'm gonna guess it probably went to scrap realistically. That's so cool though. I wish I had a tree car. I don't know if I'm driving around. Oh, a little tree house as you're driving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. But another thing I love about this scene, I love how at the end Peggy radios down to them on the ground from the, the helicopter. Yeah. And they just kind of talk back. <laughs> yeah. That was good. So they're out of the car at that point. Um, yeah. And I guess they can hit, because she doesn't say it very loudly either. She just kind of mumbles the line. Mm. And I guess they can hear her over the helicopter. Maybe yeah. she's really close at that point. Um, so, yeah, they they answer back to her, which is fantastic. Oh. Um, but this is just after putting the man out on fire. Um, yeah. So, I guess, I don't know. You know how, like, 
in a crisis, mums can lift cars up. <laughs> Maybe their hearing gets really good. I don't know. <laughs> so next scene we have is establishing their awareness of the samurai cop. This is the Fujiyama gang. Um, so the thing that I noticed with this scene is the big guy who lasts to the end of the movie. Yeah. He's given a lisp by the sound quality. Like every S he says goes all crispy in the sound because whatever's going on with the microphone here is not good. Mm. Um, it makes it pretty unlistenable. Honestly, I've had to start listening over some of my earlier episodes recently. Oh, yeah. And it's a painful experience, you know, because I've changed the way I've done things. I'd like to think I've improved. I guess I'll leave that up to the, the audience to decide. Yeah. Um, but honestly, um, this film made me realise that I'd started in a position where I was better than... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty sure it isn't it? So you were doing sound better than... I don't know how much budget they had, but... I'm going to say... Probably a bit higher than what, you know, you spend on the podcast, I would think. Oh, God, yeah. I know, but... I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a realistically... <laughs> But yeah, um, essentially, the point of this scene is, are oh, good guys. <laughs> I mean, I guess they're good guys. They have just set a man on fire. But, you know, they've taken this man to the hospital. The police want to question him, but they, they can't yet because he's too burned. Meanwhile, the leader of the Katana gang wants this man dead so that he can't talk, basically. Yes. So it's one of those cartoonish injuries where they have to wrap your whole body up mm. which is is quite cute it's like a a comic strip <laughs> version of being injured yeah um so the the samurai cop and frank they talk to some of their staff and they say look you have to keep this guy safe yeah you cannot let anyone in yeah they do all that they've got security blah 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 all of that's ready and then there's a lady that's going in to take the trash out oh my goodness yeah um <laughs> Oh, are we? Oh, we're in the summer. I've seen Skidward a lot. Best yeah. scene of the film. What am I talking about? So, okay. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how we can approach this. <laughs> so, basically, you've got the doctor. Yes. She's told them that um, the lips of the past are too burned to talk. Yes. And then, well. Well, I start with the story. Just jumping in there. The lips of the person are too burned to talk. Yes. Is that a thing? I guess. Is this what talking comes out of the lips? <laughs> I mean, surely he could, like, mumble yes and no or whatever. You think so? Why do the lips matter so much? But, what? Well, so we've got this, this horrifically bad man in the hospital. Yes. And then uh, the doctor, or, um, yeah, the doctor. I think, well, I think he says nurse. No, that's okay. okay. I'm yeah. sorry, this is the early 90s, so it's a woman. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but she basically just goes, do you like what you see? Yes. Out of nowhere. Yeah. To the cap, to Samurai Cop. Yeah. And he goes, yes, I do. And she goes, is it like, would you like to touch what you see? Yeah. Would you like to touch it or something like that? And, and he goes, yes. Yeah. Would you like to blank? Blank what you see. Uh, by which I mean, uh, have a uh, relation. Have, have, have a relation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, bingo. <laughs> he can't believe his luck. Yeah. Because he's so handsome, women just throw themselves at him. Yes. But then she grabs an area, mm, if you will. This is off screen, so you can't actually see her do this. I don't know. She might have amazing, like, hands. <laughs> so she could tell. She's like, it's not big enough, basically. Yeah. She, uh, she goes, interested. Uh, I, were you circumcised? And he goes, yes. And she goes, well, she might, your doctor must have cut off a big portion. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's horrifically awkward. It really is. And yeah. Uh, and what I want to know is did the nurse go into that conversation with the intention of just mocking Samurai Cop? Or was she genuinely like, I, I want to sleep with this guy? And then uh, she just does a quick check and is like, ah, actually, I I'm out. <laughs> now nah, I'm all right. I think the thing I, I find quite funny is that she goes, Were well, you circumcised? So you went, Yes. And she says, uh, They must have cut off a big chunk. And he went, no, I had a good doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, kind of a response to that. <laughs> and, and all throughout as well, we've got Frank, who's watching all this go on, and in after almost every line of the conversation, it cuts to Frank, who will pull a funny face 
as a response to what he's seeing. So yeah. he'll kind of do a sort of face at one point, and then he sort of laughs a little bit at some of the kind of lines. I, I will say for anyone who's who's listening, well, well hopefully someone's listening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, if you want to see the face he's pulling, it's probably going to be the uh, you know the picture for this episode. <laughs> realistically, <laughs> it is funny. It's a really funny scene. It's got all the hallmarks of a bad movie in one brilliant, tragically bad part of the movie. It's great. I really enjoyed it. But then we get to the part of the scene, uh, like you were saying, where Samurai Cop instructs that no one is allowed in the room except nurses and doctors. So the very next second. Yeah, almost immediately, the one cop that's been given the job to sort of check has allowed a random lady in with some... A, a big cover on some trolley, so enough space for a man to hide in it. A big man. A big man. And guess what? A big man is hiding in it. But I love this because they just take the, the thing off and you've got the big samurai guy. He's just crouched down and he just gets up. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he pops up like a puppet in a puppet show. He gets his sword out and it really is weird. He, like, places it on the guy... And then the next thing you know, he's pulling a head off. <laughs> really reminds me of a, um, there's a, do you know the film The Brain That Wouldn't Die? It might seem- well, yeah, you, you've shown me, I think, a bit of that, yeah. So there's a bit in that film where, like, the main character and his girlfriend are riding down the road. Yeah. And they crash. And, like, basically, he, like, rolls down a hill. Yeah. And then he runs back up the hill, the car's on fire, and you see, like, a hand coming down. Like, you know, as if, like, his, his girlfriend's just, like, died. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they grab something from the car and runs off to this weird house. Right. And then you find out he's just grabbed her head. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I can see the resemblance to that scene. I I like the fact that he has to hide with the head. Mm. That's quite good. So he takes the head, because uh, in the previous scene, did Fujiyama say he wants his head on his piano? Yes. Something like that. So he has to bring the head with him. But he also has to hide with the head. He comes out remarkably clean for a man that has severed a head. I honestly, I don't even know why it was as funny as it was. Like just watching him getting into the thing and just crouching down <laughs> each other. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. And then they try and chase them around. Like they try and stop them from leaving the hospital. <laughs> it's very odd. There's a couple of scenes like this where there's sort of a bit of dramatic tension and there's kind of a little bit of a chase going on. But there's no music. It's all kind of done basically in yeah. silence and it really does go to show how important it is to have the right dramatic sound effects and music in those scenes because there's no tension whatsoever it's really <laughs> awkward to watch well, until it kicks in yeah and you know like you say it's almost like they've forgotten yeah but the other plot i love of this is when they've got down in the uh in the sort of the elevator and then he gets out and again like you say he's remarkably clean yes and then he just does like the, the loveliest puppy dog guy <laughs> just as he's waiting to see if he's allowed out yeah he does like a really sweet face i don't know what i don't really know how to describe that basically it would be impossible to say what emotion he's conveying yeah. I, I he just looks like a sort of lost child doesn't he <laughs> so that's quite fun i did enjoy that scene <laughs> Oh. Then there's three instances of people coming up to him and go, hey, stop. Yeah. And they just punch them. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> that happens three times in a row and then they get away. So that was a good a, a good effort, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. to get them. Uh. After this, I think we go into the office with the cats in. Um, and this is where there's a little bit of background uh, laid out for Samurai Cop as to what's going on here. It turns out Samurai Cop's been brought in by Frank. Yeah. He's only been there a week, and he's been brought in to deal with the Katana gang. Yeah, I, I do think the boss does have a bit of a point here, though. The Samurai Cop arrived a week ago. Yes. He's already set one person on fire, killed two others, one of which he ran over. Yeah. One person's had their head chopped. I mean, admittedly, that wasn't his fault they had their head chopped off. No. Like... There has been a lot of death. A lot has happened, but I do think it's harsh to blame Samurai Cop for for all of this within a week. It's yeah. quite a quick movement for him to have caused all that. But either way, this captain is, is furious. The scene ends on an extremely strange note where he goes to sleep, I think. Or like kind of lays back and closes his eyes and Frank goes and gives him a kiss. And he's annoyed at that, but then after a while he smiles. <laughs> 
So I don't know. I don't really know what to read into that part of it. I don't know. I, I guess he, he's showing his fun side. Yeah, he loves he's angry really. that he can. <laughs> yeah, he, it's, it's just banter. Yeah, it's all banter, isn't it? They know he's got his softer side. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that's what we learn. Mm. There, I mean, talking of banter, the banter in the um, the kind of police environment is always so bad. Oh, like there's a lot of like attempts at flirty banter and it's always come off it comes off as far too forced you know when you're flirting with someone you're not there going would you like to blank me like yeah <laughs> yeah so, like, honestly the worst one is keep it warm for yeah th- <laughs> he keeps saying keep it warm for me which i don't know what he means i i think i know what he means yeah but if that's what he means i don't know what he means i don't know if that makes any sense at all <laughs> yeah like yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I've, never, like, I've never thought about the warmth. Is what I'm saying. I okay. the temperature's never bothered me. <laughs> Ice cold for me. Ice cold. I like room temperature. That's the one I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> it's very very difficult to talk about what yeah. I'm implying without going PG. But I'm not comfortable talking about <laughs> no. It, which is why I think it's so, like, um, upsetting almost that he just, just throws that into conversations with women that he works with. Imagine that, like, yeah, like, I'm just imagining, like, in the workplace, you just go, keep it warm for that's the big charge. You'd be out, yeah. yeah. Are, are, you would not survive in a workplace, those that like, kind of thing. It's just such a weirdly gross, like. Yeah, it's very, like, biological almost. Yeah. You know I mean, it's strangely sort of. It's not sexy at all, no. basically. None of that. I, again, I'm not a woman, so I don't. Uh, not. A, it's you know, sure whether that works for people, but it's certainly not something I would try. Did you ever watch the In Between Us? Yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds me of when they say clunge. Yes, yeah. I know what you mean. Actually, yeah. It's just it just doesn't feel yeah right when you're trying to be like a bit flirty and sexy with someone. Mm. Just comes across as a bit too surgical. Anyway, let's swiftly move on. <laughs> I think it's right to do so. <laughs> um, so we now arrive in, basically, they found out that um, the gang, they, they, they hang out in, like, a, a restaurant-type area. Yes. And so they go and see them. I'm not sure why they do this. No, this was what we discussed when the scene was happening. What is their plan here? Because what ends up happening is they just kind of threaten them. Mm. They just shout a few threats at them. The solicitor who sat, with the gang kind of pipes up and is like i'll sue you for defamation and you're insulting my client and stuff mm. um so it feels like they're just kind of walking into a a trap like, they wouldn't yeah. be out this openly if they didn't feel like they were getting away with it with the local police i'm not sure what those two cops thought they were doing well there, there's a few bits in this this scene that i do love i will say like one is like you were saying with the lawyer there's a bit where Samurai Cop literally goes, I want to put you all in body bags. Yeah, yeah, which I don't think you're allowed to say that no. to innocent people. <laughs> the next part that I, I, I quite like is just his speech he does. Yes. And in, in fairness, I, I do agree with roughly what he's saying. Like, you know, there are a lot of uh, good Asian people who live in this country, who follow the rules, who start businesses. Yes. And, you know, they, they follow the law and these are good people. And you, you're bastards because you, you are criminals. Essentially, yeah, yeah. It's it. There's a slight. It's difficult when you're making that claim, but you're also relating it to how they're immigrants. Yeah, and you're saying you're not being well behaved immigrants. It comes. It still comes across as a little bit iffy. Do you know what I mean? Well, he then looks over at what the one American person in the uh, in the group and goes, yeah. "What are you doing with a geek like this?" <laughs> this geek was such a strange insult. I don't, I don't know whether it had a different meaning back in the 90s, but, like, a geek? He's not a geek. He's not there with a computer at his feet or whatever. I don't know why that came from, but, um, yeah, it, it gets a bit testy. Yeah. And the most reasonable thing, I mean, let's say this happened in a Mafia movie. Yeah. The Mafia gang would not immediately react with firepower no. at that moment in time. They know they're protected. They have their solicitor. They have it all wrapped up in a bubble, their whole operation. What happens with this lot is that as soon as they leave the restaurant, they decide to have a firefight with them. Um, that it is, it includes Uzis in grenades. 
Yeah, I think a bit. Bef- there's a bit between that and kind of Mads to earlier, where you know, like he's trying to find the the number for the uh, the, the woman. Oh yes, oh my. God. And then you get the most over the top sort of Asian character, basically. Yeah, yeah. And it's so uncomfortable. It's extremely camp, yeah. right? Isn't it? And. Uh, yeah, it's it's not a good look. It's awful. It's, it's probably the most badly aged scene in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a movie where there are three unnecessary mentions of Frank being black. Yes, yeah. Uh, as well. So it's it's not. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> it it really doesn't come across well. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, like you say, our two heroes leave the restaurant after this. And immediately are confronted with the, the gang who have decided they need to kill them. And here you see like this rapid escalation and it almost feels like they're going through levels in a video game. The first gang member attacks them just using his fists and is, you know, quickly disposed of. Then a man attacks with a handgun. Then a man attacks with a samurai sword. And finally, the last guy who's, you know, kind of our main henchman for the film has an Uzi. And a grenade, yeah. Oh, the grenade. It's yeah. not about the grenade. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they kind of up, up stakes. But my point really around this whole thing is I think the angle of we're going to protect our operation and our solicitor is going to complain about your conduct, it kind of falls away once you then shoot at the cops. Yeah. I don't think there's any arguments anymore. Funnily enough, after this scene, that solicitor still turns up at the police station to complain about their behaviour, <laughs> which <laughs> seems a bit... Uh, petty. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, they have a fire fight. Obviously, I mean, Samurai Cop, I don't want to spoil anything, but he's not going to lose a fight in it, throughout this movie. He's not going to get hit by a bullet. He wins every fight. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, I, I never know how true this actually is, but did you ever hear the thing about, like, Dwayne Johnson? Yeah, that he can't lose a fight. Is that yeah, the film? I, I'm always a bit sceptical, but if that is true, then it's kind of the same. <laughs> yeah, was he, he's not allowed to lose a fight, and he has to be attracted to every woman character in yeah, the yeah. film, and possibly that one guy in the restaurant yes. at the end there. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's it's all a bit... Um, it's one of those... You know how people can... Compl- like, people who don't like uh, women complain mm. about uh, Mary Sue characters? Mary Sue characters? Yeah, so this is a thing in, like, anti-feminist people, oh, which I, and I want to make it very clear, I, I think those people are idiots, right? But... <laughs> But they don't like characters that are female and have only good qualities, effectively. Oh, that whole thing. Yeah, that's the whole thing, right? He's a good example of that. <laughs> he got <laughs> like, this got no reports whatsoever. So what? <laughs> so it's not like that's a female problem. There's plenty of male characters that are supposedly perfect. So yeah, it, it did make me think of that. That's, that's actually very good. <laughs> um, I like the bit where. Um, there's a guy who's just pointing the gun at him, so he throws a sword and chops up his arm in this scene. Oh, yeah. that's I, Some of these things, I forget they happen because they're so sort of inconsequential to the characters. Mm. Like, they have run over a man and well, set a man on fire at this point, and it's easy to forget that. Do you remember, like, after he's chopped off the arm, uh, Frank's famous line here? What did he say? I forgot. Damn. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. You'd probably react a little bit more to a man having his arm cut off. You think so? I might swear, to be honest. I also just want, like, I mean, it's fine, when someone gets their arm chopped off, whatever, there's just blank expressions on people's faces as they see it, like, oh, I guess that happens. Yeah. No one reacts to anything, do they? It's all it's all very passive. Um, so they get away from this gunfight. So the next scene is when he turns up at the lady who was with the gang. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was hanging out with a geek. Yeah. Hanging out with a geek. Mm-hmm. He comes over and sort of... It's hard to tell. He's sort of questioning her, but he's also clearly romantically interested. Yeah. Or at least physically attracted to this woman. Um, and, I mean, I've never seen two characters with less chemistry no. than these two. They have nothing going for them. The one thing I will say about this scene, I just always look at the, the line on the wall. Oh, I, yes. I don't know what it is. It's a very ugly, like... It looks like something you'd make at a paper mache yeah. class. And you go, oh, I made it, so I guess I'll keep it. Did you ever watch, uh, I think it was like, um, it was not, I'm pretty sure it was Live Witch and Wardrobe, but not like the new one. Yeah. Where like, there's a mixture of like, you have a real line and sometimes it's a weird kind of like, animatronic thing and sometimes yeah. it's a cartoon. 
for some reason, it always reminds me of that film, but I don't know why. <laughs> it's been years since I've seen it. I've seen that for a long time, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's got, it does look, is it Aslan? Is that the character? Yeah. Yeah. Aslan. It does have a bit of an Aslan quality to it, but, but if you had 10 pounds to remake that movie, perhaps. Mm, yeah. Or like, I don't know if you've ever seen the, um, I know it's not, um, taxidermy, but the bad taxidermy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have seen that. That's, yeah. That's great. Mm. Um, but yeah, like you say, just no chemistry. I mean, I wouldn't say there's no point to this scene. There's, you know, it's clearly supposed to be the uh, the first proper meeting between Samurai Cop and the Katana Gang, and also, you know, it establishes his his sort of like coming love story with uh, the woman, uh, Gen- Jennifer, I think it is. But at the same time, because there's no chemistry and because it goes on for f- far too long, it's just a very awkward scene. It is an awkward scene. The only other thing it does is establish that she goes to church, which will, will come into it later because yeah. um, they will meet up at church. Well, the thing is, you, you say nothing else happens in the scene, but as soon as he leaves. Yes. Yeah, this was really confusing. He was like dropped in, in, into a fight. Like he left the house and then he's in a fight, basically. And I don't quite know what happened, because he looks like he's behind a stage or something. I don't know where he is. It's really bizarre. It's like a weird, like, you know, like maybe like a club, but before it's actually officially open for the public or something. Yeah. So we're yes. still setting up. Yeah. That was kind of the vibe it gave me. But then, yeah, like, I don't know how he got here, because there was supposed to be in a restaurant. There was no kind of build-up to this. And, and like I say, it's not like you see him walk out of a door, even. He's just in the middle of that yeah. room, and suddenly that's what's happening now. Um, so the the point of this is that he manages to actually chase down one of the uh, the goons, I suppose, mm. and he's able to capture and get some information out of him. This goon tells him that the bold guy from the beginning is the one that hired him. Yeah. And according to Samurai Cop, that makes it possible to arrest him now because he can be charged with hiring four assassins to kill yeah. a cop. You did say something whilst watching this scene, and I think you might be right. You said he basically goes, oh, my leg. Yeah. And that fall, I do think it looks quite realistic. I I bet he did fall. Well, it doesn't seem like the sort of line they would write in. So, yeah, he kind of falls over, doesn't he? He goes, oh, my leg. And I I think that could have actually been him injuring his leg. I think 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 it's possible he picked up an injury. um, And, you know, like Lord of the Rings, they just left it in. Yeah. Um, Right. So basically, though, uh, Samurai Cop interrogates this goon and finds out the, the location of one of the leader's houses. You, you know, the bald guy. So the very next scene just has our two main heroes, along with uh, Peggy and another cop at the, uh, you know, this leader's house. Yeah, we're going at breakneck pace here because there's, again, no scene between these no, two. No. He interrogates that guy and now they're at the bald guy's house. Ready to raid it. Again, like what? So... There's a few bits there. Again, he tells the female cop to keep it warm for him, <laughs> which, again, she then flirts with the uh, with Frank. Well, let me clarify. He does, she, she flirts with Frank by saying, do you want a blank? Yeah. Again, that's not flirting. <laughs> I've never had anyone flirt like that. No, and then she asks the, the older kind of cop if, if they want to... Uh... Oh, sorry, that's what I meant. Yeah, she says that to the older cop. I, yes, she does flirt with... Um, does she say Frank? Yeah, she flirted with Frank. Yeah, she does because um, I can't remember exactly why, but they're talking about him losing yes. his uh, his penile area. Yes, you're uh, right. Uh, then she's like, "Well, you may as well use it before you can lose it." Yes, no, you're right. That is flirting. That's that's fine. I'm fine with that. Um, but then, yes, um, you probably heard my stomach there. It made a made a noise. <laughs> oh, that's your bit. No, that was my stomach making noises. Um, uh, yes. After that, she then propositions the older cop effectively yeah. uh which he, he turns down well I, okay and then we go into the house where the bald guy just happens to be sleeping with a woman but yes why not i guess um yeah they've lost their mind a little bit they're just throwing sex in left right and center <laughs> they must have been feeling a bit as <laughs> poorly that day i guess well, I don't feel like there's a couple of bits it's like okay so they see him sleeping with a woman and they basically just go well, that's the last time he'll be doing that. <laughs> Talk about rubbing it in, goodness, isn't it? <laughs> just sort of running through the house in his underwear. Yeah, he looks extremely panicked. At some point, he dresses himself. I must have missed that. Let's see. Oh, yeah, and then he... 
he does a, a tumble roll out of a window for absolutely no reason. He's not really being pursued at that point. No. Just does it to look cool. <laughs> They had some sugar glass laying around. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they wanted to use it. <laughs> um, I mean, imagine that. You want to use some sugar glass, but you can't incorporate the way that it would make sense to and throw I, yourself out of it. I will point out, in this particular scene, this is where he's wearing the wig. I mean, our main character. Yeah. So this was shot seven months after the initial filming. Right. So maybe they did just have it, and they're like, damn, I never got to use this. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you found a, a fiver yeah. in the back pocket, and you thought, I could spend it on a new prop. I don't know. Um, but it, it was worth it because we both commented on it. Mm, yeah, yeah. It gave us a talking point. So he has a fight with this guy and this is his first... Eventually they get to a point where he's cornered. And what if they cornered, there are three shrubs around then, uh, that he decides he can't get through. Yeah, and also like you just find out later there's a massive field to the side, essentially. Yes, this, this fight... The location of this fight doesn't make any sense at all. It's extremely inconsistent. It goes from this kind of leafy greenery to, like, just sand, I think. Sort of, like, yeah, like, you know, like, sort of, like, outskirt desert kind of. Yeah. And I don't know how that happened, but it happened somewhere in the midst of the fight. Yeah. Anyway, the point being, they drop their guns. They decide that they're going to fight like samurai. Mm. Um, so they do some poses as samurai do. Yes, yeah. And then they have a fight. Uh, which I think, I don't know if this is meant to be implied that Frank, who observes this, is furious. Because a couple of times during the movie, Samurai Cop goes to do a bit of Samurai on someone and and Frank just shoots them. In yeah, fact. yeah. So maybe he's like, actually, this one, I think it's only fair that Samurai Cop does do some Samurai stuff in this movie. <laughs> I, I, I got the fact that it's quite clearly sped up as well. Yeah, they, they must have just done like slow moves and then sped it all up. It's cute. Again, I don't mind when you can see those techniques yeah. uh, in movies so much. I, 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 With these kind of scenes, my favourite thing to do is... You don't see so much in this scene, I don't think, but like looking at the background just to see if yeah. branches are moving quickly and stuff like that. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's a good way of spotting it. I have a question. Where is this set? Do you know? America. Okay. <laughs> All right. they, they never say, do they? They, know, they? There's a brief mention of some people from New York coming over, and he's from San Diego, Samurai Cop. Yeah. But I don't think they ever mention we where just it's know, set. We just know he came from there, I think. Yeah. He was uh, in Japan, where he was learning the way of the samurai. Oh, yeah. Remember that we have that great scene where they go, Katana, what does that mean? He goes, it means Japanese sword. <laughs> He wouldn't know that if he hadn't been living in Japan for that's many the, years. That's the kind of ancient wisdom you only learned from the real samurai. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah, he moved to San Diego, I think, was that? And now he's here. Yes. Yeah, yeah that sounds about right. Um, this fight goes on for a while. I'm trying to remember how it ends. Does he Does he kill him? Oh, I think he does, doesn't he? So, yeah, they basically, they, they drag him to, um, to like, this bridge. And yeah. they've broken his arm. Yeah. And, well, essentially... They want to arrest him. So, um, Samurai cops us walking away, leaving it to Frank. Yes. But then the guy grabs Frank's gun and is about to shoot Samurai Cop when Samurai Cop turns around and shoots him instead. Yes. Basically. Yeah. Again, just another instance of Samurai Cop having to be the hero and not being able to lose any specific situation. He was able to see that coming and shoots uh, the bold guy. So he's dead. Yeah. And he goes, that's another witness we've shot. Yeah. So he's furious. Why do I keep killing people? <laughs> I feel so sorry for myself. <laughs> so we now arrive at the next scene. Here we have the Katana gang gathered around and our main goon is, is basically telling Fujiyama, you know, the boss, that they have some new enemies in the police because <laughs> somehow he, he wasn't even aware of this already, you know, even though Samurai Cop has killed quite a few of them. Um, Fujiyama suggests that they pay them off to make the issue go away, but our main goon says that he has already tried this. I'm not sure when this happened, but, you know, hey-ho. No, that's true. I don't know what... Was there might have been a scene that they had to cut for time. Mm, maybe, yeah. But Fujiyama says something along the lines of, we don't want to kill them, because that would be too obvious, but we do want to break their legs. Hmm. So, that is not reflected in what happens next. Well, then they just try and kill them. Yeah, that's what I was thinking just then. I was like, hang on a minute. They say that, 
But there's no attempt to do that, is there? No. It's almost immediately after this, they go around houses trying to kill people. Yeah, so I don't actually completely understand the next scene. So you, you have Samurai Cop. And this other guy. Yeah. And they're basically, are they like a, 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 a printer place or something? I don't really know where they're supposed to be. No, I wasn't sure what was happening. Uh, oh, that was, the, the, yeah, they said they're going to hire some people from New York to come and do this job on Samurai Cop. I completely missed that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was something that was mentioned. And then, yeah, he's in a completely different location with different people. So it really threw us at this point. We were like, what's happening here? Also, he has a hat on. Yeah, it's almost hard to tell that it's Samurai. I mean, but. to be honest with you, they always talk, you know, like about like, um, sort of like those Superman Clark Kent. Oh, it's really obvious. Yes. But honestly, there's a few different disguises <laughs> that Samurai Cop has when he's not trying to look like a different person. <laughs> yeah, and it works. It's yeah. impressive. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this was really weird. This scene kind of came out of nowhere. And then I feel like maybe, do you know what? I think what might be the case here is that. This is their attempt to break Samurai Cop's legs. Right. It doesn't go yeah. very well because Samurai Cop kills each and every one of them. Uh, and then after that, he we get scenes where he gets off with Fujiyama's girlfriend. Uh, I think That's right. why I think he becomes murderous. So give the movie credit. It's a, There is at least some explanation for why the ante is ramped up. Yeah, for, yeah. I love the way everyone dies in this film. Like, yeah, like there's one guy in this scene who he's climbing the stairs, and then Samurai Cop shoots him once. The man doesn't even seem to react to this at all. He then shoots him again, and the man kind of like half-heartedly reacts to this. Then Samurai Cop shoots him like two more times before he eventually falls down. I've never seen anyone react to uh, a bullet with such disinterest. Yeah, I mean, it's just such a weird like. I have to admit, I sometimes couldn't tell when they'd actually died, the people that he was shooting at. Because they would just kind of lollop over, um, and that would be it. Yeah. But it's hard to tell sometimes if they're just kind of like leaning back so they don't get shot, or if they've actually been shot. So it's not very convincing at any point. No, no, yeah. So I just saw one there, and I'm like, yeah, none of this is, is good. Now we get to a scene where another one we were talking about before, where like, so you've got um, the, the 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 love interest. Yeah, she just come out of church. Yeah, there's one of the member of like the gang waiting for her with a nice car, and then we see. Well, we actually didn't know it was Samurai Cop at first. We I I assumed it was another member of the gang. Yeah, at first because he's kind of got his hair pulled back in a ponytail. He's wearing a nice suit. Yeah, it doesn't look like him, does it? No. It's, and, and his skin complexion looks a bit different as well. So just everything about him looks a bit not quite Samurai Cop. Mm. He is there to meet the girl. And he's just been to church with her, right? Like, he said he did a sermon? He was, like, uh, in the back somewhere, I think, of, like, the um, the church. Okay, fine. But I think there is actually a reason he looks so different. Have you noticed how in a lot of the indoor scenes he's he's quite orange? Yes, yeah. And also, have you noticed how there are absolutely no scenes shot at night in this film? Uh, no, I didn't, but yeah. So basically, the reason for this was because uh, they couldn't actually afford the lighting for these scenes. So I'm wondering if uh, they have some scenes that are kind of like in darker locations, and this just makes him look slightly orange. Mix that with uh, a different hairstyle and suit, and well, suddenly he's a completely different person. That might be right because he really does. In this scene, he doesn't look that color almost, no. and that's why I think it's through us at first. It was almost like this is a different person. Yeah, but then you go into his house, and I'd say he does look a little bit orange. Yes, yeah, it starts to come back. So yeah, that's that's probably true. Actually, maybe it's to do with the outdoor scene. Maybe because actually that scene where he is coming out of the church, it does look a bit washed for color. It kind of yeah. looks blue almost. Mm. Um, so he's brought her back home. Yes, effectively, she decides I'm not going to go to the horrible mafia boss uh, anymore. I'm going to go with Samurai Cop. Yeah, um, and this betrayal is enough, I guess, to set. Fujiyama on a murderous rampage. Mm, mm. And boy, does he uh, go on a rampage. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah, it gets pretty hairy pretty quickly. I like the fact that Samurai Cop and uh, this girl, who really, I have no idea what her name is, by the way. No, I don't. I've been <laughs> trying to avoid so it. so bad. 
<laughs> not remembering names or just not picking them up. But they get on super quickly to the point where they are, you know, kissing, they're in the pool, having a great time. And by the I end love. of this, yeah, by the end of this scene, this one time that they've spent together, she's in love with him. She openly declares to her mother by the end of this that she loves Samurai Cop. Yeah. Because he's that irresistible. And right. Not the cop. Sorry. So, now we go into a bit. We both thought this was like the, uh, like the cop in the sort of like the, the, the captain. I have no idea who this person is being killed. Yeah. So, when we watch this next scene, the goons come in and it looks like the captain, or at least that's what I thought it was. But now I'm looking at. I'm not even sure how we came to that conclusion. I don't know why. I don't know why we decided that was a captain. But um, the goons come in and are threatening him, asking for information. Who is this guy? <laughs> no, I don't know. Who is, who is this person? So again, it's another scene where we've just got a bunch of people we don't know who they are, except for the main goon, and they threaten this guy and say, "We're a samurai cop. We're going to kill your wife and stuff." He says he doesn't know, and so they do. They kill him and his wife. It's a bit pointless, to be honest. Now I think about it. There's no reason for this scene to exist. We don't know who this character is. Well, the thing is, it would have made sense if it was the boss. But yeah. Okay, he does come up later in the film, but at the same time, he's not an integral part of the plot. No. And it would have added some kind of, like, you know, emotional stakes. Yeah, that would genuinely be a little... It was a little bit sad when I thought it was the boss. It was like, oh, well, he's white dead. But I, see, I mean, outside of the very, very blatant cuss at one point, where just the, music, the, the music just stops. Yes. There is a part of the scene that's quite unsettling when he's, like, slitting her throat. Yeah. But, like... Yeah. But the, it's taken away from the fact that we now know that they're, these are not people... The, maybe they are people we've seen, but I, I genuinely don't remember. It's not the older cop, is it? That, you know, like, uh, she flirts with outside the house. You know, uh, Peggy. Oh, maybe. Because the next person they go after is Peggy. It's oh, always just always great when you're figuring out a scene, as you want. <laughs> you know, you're doing just... oh, think, do we both have face blindness? Or, because, because we seem to be having a lot of trouble keeping track of who's who. <laughs> Sometimes we'll do samurai cop with another movie. <laughs> 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 Seems to be struggling quite a bit. Have you seen this before? You don't know what. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. I've seen this one like five times. <laughs> Why am I struggling so much? Okay, but let me basically. Okay, so you go to the one scene where uh, Samurai Cop and and uh, the love interest. I can't remember the name of because I went with it. Um, they're outside. He's in like a pair of speedos. She's yeah. like in like a sort of bathing suit. Yeah, and they're all. In love. Yeah, they have now. He, he's turned up to church once and she went, he's a nice guy. <laughs> I love him. But, okay, so they killed off this, this random old guy. They sent, what, well, like five people to deal with him, including the boss. Yeah, yeah. And now we go to Frank's house where there's just two people. Yeah, they decide he doesn't need as much attention uh, being the cop that's killed half of their people. Um, and Frank is able to distract how does he do it yeah he distracts one of them by sending him over to his coat i love that because there's like the, the 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 stuff he needs in that coat i can't find it wait it's not here maybe it's in this coat no <laughs> what in this coat there's nothing in it <laughs> it is it is a bit like um he's just asking to be betrayed at that point is he? he he knows what he's doing there eventually he's able to kind of how does he get the other guy over? Does he... He basically... So, the other guy, um, he's, like, pointing a gun at him. He's, he's got a, like, by the neck at that point. Yeah. Frank reaches down to the table. There's a pair of scissors. Oh, and he yes. Stabs him. That's right. Yeah. And then he spins him around and holds the scissors to his neck. And the other guy goes, hey, hey. Yeah. Stop it now. <laughs> Let him go. <laughs> yes. Um, there's, there's a bit here where he offers... His butt as information. I forgot about that as well. What? I don't remember that. <laughs> they, say, they say we want information and he goes, what, about my butt or something like that? <laughs> I don't remember exactly what the line is, but it was a bit awkward. Uh, um, so yeah, they, they get killed by Frank. He's yeah. too, he, he's too main to be killed at this point. Mm. Oh, that's right. They were trying to chop off his penis, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. That's another thing that was going to happen here. Again, a lot of attention towards his, specifically his, Penis and yeah. arm. Yeah. And I don't quite know why there's so much focus around that. 
always followed on by just pointing out he's black. Yes, yeah, usually like, like there are a couple of times where he goes, yeah, I do have a black ass. <laughs> 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 Who, who wrote this? I like, quite sorry, but it's like, yeah, my ass is black, and then they just high five. <laughs> you know, at one point they do high five. Like, that's such a cool fact. <laughs> so that's, yeah, there's lots of really awkward references to yeah. race in this movie. I don't know why they exist. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely <laughs> uncomfortable. Well, then we go back to our um, our two lovebirds. Yes. Our samurai cop and woman. Yeah, again, I like, I feel like you get a really good insight into directors and writers based on how they make a scene around two people who are supposed to be in love. In this circumstance, the way you show that they're in love is they're having fun uh, whilst in bathing suits. Yeah. Like, that's that seems to me in, in some way representative of the mindset of that person. Like, you're in love because you feel sexy and you're all sexy with each other. That's how you know they're in love. Yeah, it's I interesting. Just had a thought, right? So, you know, you were, like, saying he's a bit like a, a sort of almost uncanny valley kind of like Tommy Russo. Yes, yeah. I think this is what Tommy Russo wants to look like. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. I think Tommy Russo thinks he looks like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, in fairness to the guy, he's in, he's in fantastic shape. Yeah, um, yeah, he's a, yeah. Yeah, during, oh. the, during the making of this film, he only ate tr um, shredded chicken and nothing else. He thought it made him look more lean. Do you know what? I could do that diet. He totally loved chicken. I would just eat plain chicken. Uh, I, I think that's quite good. So right. He probably had the time of his life. Yeah. But then we go to a scene where basically they take, they've tried to take out Frank. They've failed. They've taken out uh, other person. Peggy. You know, Peggy. That, well, no, no, no. Oh, sorry. And no, now they're my... taking out Peggy. Yeah. Yes. Apologies. Yeah. They took out that guy. Mm. Um, Peggy is uh, able to fight off a few of them, largely because the first person to enter her home announces that he's there. Um, six feet away from her so he, she is able to react but eventually they pin her down the way they get information out of her is they pour a hot frying pan's worth of water onto her to be fair like that's it's quite supposed to be quite as well or something but was it egg it's, it looks like water i, I don't know maybe oil. It is or yeah something which is kind of brutal actually yeah genuinely like unsettling torture scene uh yeah quite quite horrible to watch I say this is probably one of the most effective parts of the movie mm. um, from a technical perspective. I, I can't say I enjoyed it, but no, but you're not supposed to. But they are, you know, at this point, they are making a movie that's got some sort of element of being compelling and quite well put together. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I mean, with this one, the things that they do wrong aren't as terrible as some of the other movies we've watched. It's not like Man Lost the Hands of Fate, where. It's, it's, it's just completely rubbish from a technical perspective. This is just bad enough that you can enjoy it for being bad without it being overly bad, if that makes sense. Yes, no, that does make sense, yeah. So, um, but anyway, Peggy gets tortured. She gives information about Samurai Cop's address mm. at this point. So they have the address. Um, and how does Frank find out that they have the address? Is um, Frank doesn't find out they have the address. He just knows that they're after him. So... Uh, yeah, this is how they find out the information of where he is. Frank is trying to get hold of um, Samurai Copper. Samurai Copper's all in love, so he's the hard to find. Right, okay. And then okay. he eventually does when they're lying in bed together. Yeah. And okay. that's when he just goes, looks out the window and sees three people creeping up to the house, which is very convenient. Yeah, good timing, as as we said at the time. Mm. I, I would just point out, whilst because as you're flicking back and forth on YouTube, um, that scene of a mostly naked samurai cop and the woman kissing appears to be the most replayed part of the youtube <laughs> video so maybe i'm wrong maybe samurai cop is really attractive to people and that's maybe what they want to see i don't know how did you tell that if you go you can sort of see as you scroll back look most replayed huh how did you never know to say you've never seen that before okay that is I, if, if people are watching the scene that is genuinely disturbing yeah, they are. Yeah, the torture seat and then a bit of them kissing is the most replayed. I've never noticed that. Interesting little feature, isn't it? Huh. Anyway. <laughs> right, well, let's go to the most replayed. Why did I stop it here? Yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, we got the the three people creeping up to the house. Yes. And um, so he's looked out the window, he's seen them. Yeah. And so they basically try to escape the house as these people are coming, coming in. And it leads to uh, essentially... Yeah, another massive gunfight. 
Yeah, I'm I'm starting to realise as we go through this again just how repetitive this movie is. <laughs> um, it's just another gunfight. I mean, it's the same as every other gunfight in the movie, mm. uh, except there's no grenades involved um, or any other fun, elaborate aspects. Yeah, I just, yeah, all you've really got the most exciting thing in this fight, I'd say, is um, probably the the shotgun. Realistic. Oh yes, yeah, there is a shotgun. That's quite fun, I suppose. Not really. Not really. No. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even get myself going. It's just, it's just it's mildly more exciting than a, a, a pistol. I guess so. <laughs> I mean, all of this doesn't really build up to much except for um, we then get to them returning. Or sorry, the, yeah, they, they both return, don't they, to the lady... Can we find out about her name? Yeah. <laughs> it's just Sally not because it's, it's, it's just I feel like I've not been paying attention. Uh, uh her name is Jennifer. Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer. So we get to Jennifer. Jennifer goes back to her house. This is where she tells her mother, I am in love with Samurai Cop. I love him. I don't care about Fujiyama anymore. Samurai Cop went to church with me once and cooked me a dinner. Yeah. And that's giving me all the green flags I need. Um, and this is where Fujiyama appears. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, so so he he appears and, like, she's like, oh, no, you know, it's like that when you're slagging someone off. Oh, I know, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, she she's slagging him off. He turns up. He's behind you. She's like, uh-oh. Uh, and then this is where we got confused, right? Because the next bit after this is when we see the captain. Yeah. And this is where we're like, didn't he just die? But it wasn't the captain. No. <laughs> I just imagine, I don't know why, you just saying he's behind you. I'm just imagining if they made this into a pantomime. I, <laughs> I think it could be a panto. It's got as much plot as you I need for a panto. would absolutely go and watch it. Maybe we should we should set that up. I don't know how you, how do you write a panto? Who writes pantos? Uh, that must be someone's job. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You could do it, definitely. You just need to get, like, a famous comedian to star in it in some way, and then it'll be fine. That's a good question. Who would you get as a funny person to star as Samurai Cop? Do you know one interesting fact about him? Go on. He actually does stand up. Called- no way. Yeah. That's actually true. Does he talk about this? I don't know. Um, I would be surprised if he doesn't. I saw something the other day. You might have seen this before, but you know the guy that plays Biff Tannen in Back to the Future? Yeah. He does a funny... He's like a comedian. Oh, okay. And he does a funny sum about all the questions that he gets asked because he was on Back to the Future. That's it's quite good. Yeah, I'd, I'd look it up if you've not seen it. Oh, such a good film. It is a good film. I love that film. So, yeah. Um, we now arrive at another gunfight because why not? <laughs> you can't, I know. We're sort of running out of steam at this point. <laughs> um, oh, there's a cute moment here, isn't there? I don't get the joke. No, well, it doesn't make any sense. So you got Samurai Cop, he, he climbs over a fence. And then you got Frank, who climbs under a fence, which has kind of made more sense, to be honest. Yes. And then Samurai Cop, Samurai Cop goes, why did you climb underneath the fence? And then Frank just goes, I'm an undercover cop. It's a great joke, except for the fact that the word cover is plopped in the middle of it. Yeah. Because then it doesn't make any sense at all. But he seems pretty proud of it, which is nice. Yeah. And it's nice to have a joke in the film, I suppose, that... <laughs> Colourful. You mean an actual intentional joke? Yes, yeah. Not, you know, keep it warm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so, they, <laughs> so they sneak up on Jennifer's yeah. house. And this is where Fujiyama, he mentions that the mother is in the basement and he's keeping Jennifer hostage. Right. Um, and as Samurai Cop and Frank come in, he has a gun pointed at her head. Yes. I'm not even bothering talking about the gunfight because it's the same as every other gunfight. Bang, bang. Oh, look, they missed. Bang. Yeah, Samurai Cop Samurai not, one. Not reacting to any bullets. Yeah. Then, yeah, inside. wig. <laughs> then Mr. Fujiyama, uh, uh, yeah, uh, he's got a gun pointed at Jennifer's head. Yeah. Um, Samurai Cop is, okay, so wait, Samurai Cop is pointing the gun at Mr. Fujiyama. And then, like, you think they've got a perfect little ambush set up? Because you've got Frank on the stairs. Yes. Fujiyama coming forward. So, like, he's going to, you know, Frank's going to be behind him at some point. Yes, because he's coming round a corner, isn't yeah. he? So, Frank would be in a perfect position to just take him out from mm. the side. But instead, what does Frank do? He announces that he's there and then decides to walk out from behind the stairs into the same position that Samurai Cop is. Yeah. They so literally set up a perfect ambush and decided, nah. We don't fancy that. Too easy. <laughs> 
Um, so, do you know what? I've forgotten half of this gun fight. Uh, I love about this, though. Like, okay, you know what I was saying earlier? They don't use... Um, they, they're using their own houses and stuff. Yes. You yeah. can tell the items that didn't actually belong to the person in the house because they're the ones that break. Yeah, that's true, yeah. We did mention there, yeah, I remember, because during this gunfight, there's a couple of times where we go, oh, that was quite a good effect, like a bottle and rates and the TV has a bullet put in it and stuff. Like, they did put some effort in, um, which is nice. So, yeah, I guess that TV didn't belong to anyone. It looked uh, perfectly good before they shot it. Fine. Yeah. So maybe they bought that, I don't know, to shoot. Mm. But that's so expensive, wow. Yeah, potentially. Um, so, yeah, then we get to the ambush bit. Um, at this point, Fujiyama says, uh, I will shoot her. Put your guns down. And they go, oh, man, okay, I guess we'll put the guns down. They put the guns down, and Fujiyama shoots Frank anyway. Um, but Frank has another gun, or does he grab the gun that he'd already dropped? He he grabs one he already dropped. Okay, grabs the one he'd already dropped, shoots Fujiyama dead. And based, bear in mind, this is the, the main bad guy. Yeah, and the still got... What, like 15 minutes on the film? Well, there's 15 minutes of the film left. The standoff between the, the main villain and these the heroes was very short, yeah. very underwhelming. Um, and the reason Frank can get up from being shot is because he had a bulletproof vest on. But what I love about this, right, is what... So he got up and he went, are you okay? And he went, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we just laughed because, honestly, this film has been to the point where I was fully expecting that just to be him going, yeah, and then and, but explaining it. I, I was willing to accept that that could be part of the movie, yeah, that moment in time. It's one of the, Do you know how they say when you're a writer to write yourself in a corner mm. and then try and find your way out of it? Yeah. That, I think, is the only intention... Like, that's the only time they've tried to do that in this movie. They've written themselves in a corner. Frank gets shot. Yeah. How do we get out of this? He had a bulletproof vest on. <laughs> and there's no build... It's not like a Chekhov's gun where they establish the existence of the bulletproof vest at some point. No. He just has it on at that moment in time, luckily. <laughs> and then we get uh, more shooty-shooty. Yep. Uh, lots of sh shots being fired. Yeah. It's, um, what I really love about this, right, is what, like, you then get more people running out going, hey, they're here. Yes. There's been a full gunfight at this place. Their boss has been killed, and they just realised that he's there. Yeah, only now do they see that there's an actual problem. Um, we get another scene here where a guy has a samurai sword, and Frank, rather than letting samurai cop go and do his samurai stuff, shoots the guy, so he's dead. Mm. Um, but this all builds up to the final fight. Yeah. We're almost there. We are. <laughs> <laughs> and this is against the big guy, the one that kind of has been an informant to some extent with uh, Fujiyama. Yeah. He's not the main villain. This is why it's such a weird kind of structure he's for the movie. Yeah, he's a henchman. And yet, this is going to be the final big fight of the movie. This is another one where the guns get thrown down, Samurai Cop gets his sword out, and this is where you're going to see the best samurai moves of the whole film. Yes. They start from about three miles away from each other, doing their samurai poses, and then they slowly walk towards each other. And then I would say it's a, a mediocre fight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, it just takes so long for them to get to each other. <laughs> it is laughably uh, long-winded. And they do do some silly samurai stuff. And I said at the time, I don't know samurai movies, but I would imagine an expert in samurai movies would look at this and think it's a lot of nonsense, the stuff that they're doing. <laughs> and then, yeah, so they, they fight. Yeah. Um, the fight is, is, it's a fight. Yeah. He's got his wig on. Yeah, it does. Yeah. The wig is very prevalent. That's what I mean, though. Like, it does presumably mean that this, this fight was just never anticipated. In the original shooting. Which is why I think your theory that they forgot to kill this guy off yeah. holds so much water because it's it's an unnecessary thing to have in the film. But then I suppose if they didn't have it, then it's there wasn't really much samurai. You have to have it. He's one of the main... When does, do you ever get a film where the henchman doesn't die? Yeah. And, like, bear in mind, this is seven months after the original shooting. So over half a year. It would, yeah, it wasn't like they came back the next week like, oops, so yeah. we forgot something or we messed something up. So yeah, I'd really like to know the story of this. I can't quite wrap my head around it. There's a real mystery around 
why it took them that long. But the fact that this sits on the end of the movie indicates that there is some reason that they couldn't fit it into the rest of the story somehow. Yeah, I mean, the weird thing is it's not a long film, though. It's only an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. Arsi just had a lot of deleted scenes. But, no, they didn't. In fact, I know they didn't. Well, yeah. They wanted to use all of the real. Yeah, so... So they had... Do you think they must have had a little bit of space left on the reel? That's why they killed the fat. Yeah, we might as well use it. Or maybe, like... Maybe they just went, wait, wait, we managed to get more reel. (laughs) (laughs) We taped some on for the final (laughs) ten minutes. Yeah, it's it's really odd. Um, They have this fight. I like the end of this fight, actually. That's the best bit. When he goes to kill him, he's won, and the guy's like... You have bested me. You must now kill me. Mm. And Samurai Cop goes to kill him, and Frank goes, "No, you're a cop." So he's not allowed to kill him, I guess. I, uh, well, I mean, like I, I, the logic doesn't make much sense because he's murdered a lot of people. Actually. Yeah, it's not like he's been acting by the book. Uh, I guess it would be a crime to behead someone who is unarmed. I, I, as a police officer, I don't think that's allowed. Um, so instead, the guy kills himself. He stabs himself in the yes. stomach yeah. out of honour. And um, then essentially what we get, Frank doing... Nothing. I think nothing. that's it. No, the, the last scene is 10 seconds of uh, Samurai Cop and Jennifer on the beach. And that's it. That's the end of the movie. Yeah. Credits roll. And, and credits roll. Some of the credits are just <laughs> just fantastic. Here are some weird credits. It goes odd. So let, let's have a look at some of these credits, shall we? <laughs> right. So we've got... We're just going to wait for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't you love awkward silences? Uh, Tom Wideline? Tom That's an interesting name. Oh, yeah. Michael Jackson? So, yeah. Michael Jackson is the first interesting name, um, which is why we got interested in the credits. And then we've just got... These are two separate people. Gabriel and Holland, no second name. No idea if that's actually one person and they accidentally put a space in the or if there's two people who didn't want their full name included. I mean, can you blame them, really? Then you got the sound mixer, who's just Sasha. <laughs> and you got the boom operator, who's just Sean. Sean. And then there's a second assistant camera called Human for Rough. Yeah. Or Human for Rough, uh, or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, that's a bit suspicious. I still think Best Boy, Nora Lovely... <laughs> It's a best lovely boy. name. It is a lovely name. But lovely. I'm sorry, are you saying like a best boy is a real thing? Yeah, it's something to do with rigging. It's a dog. No, it's not a dog. Best boy is <laughs> it's a genuine position <laughs> dog. It's not. I promise. There is. I've see, I, I see it all the time on, on credits. Do they all have dogs in them? Potentially. I suppose. It, but they normally have second names. And they, they come, they're very human names if they're dogs, is what I'm saying. And I feel like there's probably best boys listening right now that would be highly offended. Really, really annoyed at me taking the piss out of their uh, <laughs> profession. I couldn't put that on a CV. I was the best <laughs> boy. The best boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> but yeah, so that's the, um, the end of the film. Yeah. Yeah. So, what did you think? Um, it's so so again. Sort of comparing this to the movies that we've watched together for this podcast, mm-hmm. it's technically much better than Man of the Hands of Fate. I'd agree with that. It's not as much fun as the Godzilla movie. I think the Godzilla one's the best one we've watched. Oh, I completely agree. I had mo- so much fun watching that Godzilla movie. So that one, it, it is fun. Samuel Roy Cop is fun. I yeah. enjoyed watching it, but it's not as outlandish as something like Godzilla. So it it does, like we kind of alluded to, it does repeat gunfights and repeat yeah. the same bit of plot over and over again. So the real question then, um, the only other one we've got is Troll 2. Yes, that's a good comparison. Do you want me to go first on which one I think is better? Or? Um, yeah, go, go for it. I would say Troll 2 is a better film. I mean, in terms of one, I, I enjoyed them both, but I, I, I enjoyed Troll 2 more. Yeah, I think I agree. I think I think they both had similarly good high points yeah. in terms of their silliness and campiness. But Troll 2 was a bit more consistent in being fun to watch. Yeah. I like Nilbog as a town. I liked all the kind of awkwardness around it. Samurai Cop does get a bit procedural at times, uh, especially during the fight scenes. Mm. But it, it does have those high points of the conversation with the nurse 
um, some of the the silly samurai stuff. Um, just just general awkward dialogue. It has a lot of those great things as well. Yeah, yeah. I want to know your thoughts on it on a reflective sense because you know the movie quite well. I don't know how long it's been since you saw it. Uh, I'd say a few years. What do you have any kind of reflections that have changed your view on it? It's quite interesting um, watching it again because I will admit most of the time I'm watching this, I'm not really watching the whole film. I'm watching the funny clips. Yes, yeah. Um, so watching it all again, I think the thing, I, I guess it's something I should have guessed from the theme of the film, but I, I was, I've forgotten how poorly it aged. Yeah, to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, the things that I, I will say made me appreciate it a bit more. I, I kind of like the fact that he, you know, like um, the, um, the 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 main character, you know, the actor who plays him. I I like the fact that he didn't realize that the film was a cult classic and then okay. after. So I think that's kind of love. That's nice. I like that. Yeah, um, that's good. I think the fact that like he uh, was a a sort of like bodyguard for Sylvester Stallone is really interesting as well, just because. Presumably, it means he does actually know how to fight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think he did. Any, he wasn't incompetent in his fight scenes. No. But I, I think that comes down to the direction, doesn't it? They probably didn't really have choreographers to do much with them and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think the biggest change for me watching this is just realising that they um, filmed everything and they didn't <laughs> cut anything out. Because that does explain a lot. Yes. Yeah, definitely. But does it, I mean, how, has your enjoyment of it changed, do you think, because of the fact that you now know those big scenes um, and you, you sort of, say, you can just access those whenever, do you know what I mean? So you I say what you also, I, I kind of enjoy it more. Really? Okay. Just just because, I don't know, there's something about learning about all of the inner workings of backstage stuff, if you will. Yes. And just seeing the other level of incompetence, that's just, I don't know, it... Yeah. It, I, I, it's... I can't quite comprehend it, let's put it that way. Yes, yeah. That's why I think this one does fall into that noise. It's just peeling away at the corners in terms of its badness. It's not the whole label's fallen off and you no. can barely recognise it anymore. It's, you can see beneath the surface where it's going wrong, all those little things that it's struggling with for logistical reasons or whatever. Yeah, I kind of feel with a lot of these films... Uh, they they do feel like they've been written by a child. Like it's, yes. it's someone who's just wanted the big scenes and and yeah, yeah, this is cool. I'm going to put that in kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. They they don't have the things connecting them together. Essentially, no art of subtlety. No. Yeah, absolutely. I, it feels like the sort of story. Yeah, when I was a kid, like eight nine, I'd play all these imaginary games with my friends in the playground. That seems like the sort of thing that we would have played mm. in our heads. That whole plot. <laughs> yeah, I, so, yeah. I used to play He Man in the uh, in the playgrounds. Really? Have you actually ever rewatched any of the cartoons for He Man? No, I've seen clips of of how limited the animation is. They're so like funny. Like, oh yeah, I bet it's a, an absolute riot to watch. Honestly, like they're the trippiest thing you've ever watched. But my favorite one, this one, where like they basically got these creatures. Yeah, and the the idea of the story, right, is like these these creatures that think humans are ugly, and we think they are ugly. Yeah, and the whole thing is like, um, you know, like you know, greasy is on the inside. But then at the end of the episode, he basically turns into a human. And then the narrator, like, so the moral of the story goes, and his inner beauty shone through as he turned into a human. It's like, cry out loud. I read the last <laughs> it, it was the 80s, you know. Those yeah. messages were still a bit confuzzled at that point, I suppose. No, but honestly, they're all on YouTube. Because does He-Man do a thing around, uh, you know, how they used to have, like, PSAs for kids? Mm. Like, hey, kids. It's I'm it's He Man here. I want to talk to you about not bullying. Yeah, the, no, these do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you'll have the episode, and then normally be one of the characters at the end will do like the moral message. Yeah, so yeah, I remember. Yeah, I used to like uh, the Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon, and Sonic the Hedgehog would have a message yeah. for the, the viewers, and one of the messages he had was not to climb in the dryer. <laughs> Oh, speaking of which, by the way, do not worry, I'm not going to get you to watch this one. Okay. But you know how I was saying before we started here, uh, before we started recording, the reason I like a lot of these films is because my grandparents actually had a lot of them. So the reason I like bad films is because I was watching them when I was growing up. Yeah. 
one of the ones that they had was actually the Zelda cartoon. Oh, wow. Yeah, gosh. Like, uh, for those who don't know, um, it's infamously terrible. Yeah. The, the most famous line, I believe, is, Excuse me, princess. Yeah, and he does. Yeah. Um, that was his catchphrase. Yeah, but I, I actually used to genuinely like that when I was <laughs> I don't think I ever watched it as a kid. I only heard about it as it became like a meme. I, uh, I think, realistically, it's one that's probably unwatchable. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if we run out of ideas... You know, I'll might, come and watch Zelda. I might get you one for a good film. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Although, I think, um, I remember the one time I, I annoyed you. Go on. Um, it was when I said that Zuland was a big classic <laughs> Henry Godfather. You keep saying this. I I don't think it ever annoyed me that much. You, you, you did put your head in your hands, hopefully. Or you did something. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that seems fair, though, doesn't it? Because it's, a, it's a, a horrible opinion. <laughs> it's just a wrong opinion. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe it did annoy me a bit. <laughs> in fairness, I do, I do actually like The Godfather. But I, I also was very proud of how, like, you, you look distressed. It, well, I understand it's not for everyone. It's, there's certain types of films that I don't like. And it's not because they're bad films. It's just like, Westerns. Yeah, are not for me. I don't mind westerns. Westerns, that's fair. And, and uh, but mafia movies, I think, are bad for a lot of people. Um, I yeah, I I'm on a level where I could uh, take or leave them. Yeah, uh, obviously the third one's the best. Uh, but no, I'm kidding. What? I'm not, I'm not <laughs> I've not seen the third one. Have you not? No, I've, I've seen all of them. Have you? Yeah, I've got to number two, and and that was good. It's long though. Number two is long. It's probably the best of the three. In my opinion. Yeah, so. yeah. It is good, but I just got tired. Mm. So I don't want to watch Godfather for a while now. Yeah. And then they'll probably come up with Godfather 4 at some point, I'm sure. Well, they did The Matrix 4 oh, out of nowhere. So, you know, film. I've not seen that yet. Don't. Athena wants to watch it. Honestly, um, I watched it when I, uh, when I had COVID, basically. That sounds like a bad time. Um, I watched two films. Um, one was The Lego Movie 2. Yes. Which was, you know, not as good as the first one, but it's a decent film. It's a good movie. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other one, so the, the Matrix, I put my, I was, I, I was, I was self-isolating in a motorhome. Yeah. Uh, I put my phone on the other side of the motorhome so I could watch it because I'd like a little screen. Oh yeah. Yeah. And by the end of the film, it's on my hand again. <laughs> You're just that done with it. Yeah. 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 Well, I really like the Matrix movie, so I don't know. I feel like I'm obliged to watch it. It's do, do, do you really, though, is it the first one and a half you like? I tell you, do you know what? We watched them recently, and I think all three are pretty good. Really? Yeah, yeah I've like, even the third one I think is a pretty good one. Yeah. I've not seen them for a while, admittedly. Yeah. My main thoughts for them generally are, I think the first one's got the best like pacing and best story. Yeah, yeah. The second one, actually, I do think has the best scenes. I love yeah. the eight. I know it's very animated, but I love the Asian art scenes. So good. And honestly, the car chase, I think, is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they did so good with some of those action scenes. I appreciate it's not as meaningful a story by that point, but it's a, it's very, I, I think the pacing's all off with that. Yeah. But, um, but it's got yeah. really good scenes. The fight will always kind of go anything. I think it's an, it's an interesting conclusion to the story. Uh, I don't want to give anything away, but like, I like the direction they take it. I don't think it's perfect, but I thought it was considering it was such a high concept set of movies in the first place. Um, or, you know, not even high concept, but just a, a new sort of thought around uh, story that they could write. I like the ending. I thought it was good. I think the pro one of the big problems with the fourth one, like, I'm not going to ruin anything major. Yeah. Like, I just, there's too many characters that didn't come, like, actors that didn't come back. Mm, like, yeah. a Agent Smith. Yeah. Uh, they just get another person to play him. Yes. But then they don't seem like they... We're in the Matrix. They could have explained that. They could have gone like, okay, so he's got a new skin or something. Yeah, yeah. But no, they just do a bit where like there's such dramatic music and then they do the big fight and it's like, but he's nice and Smith. Yeah. Well, why couldn't they get Hugo Weaving? I don't know. Because it's all like he's gone. He's he's still around. I just watched Mortal Engines, which is dreadful, by the way. Oh, I've seen that. That was um, I saw that in the um, in the cinema. Oh, did you? Yeah. I kind of when I was watching it, I, I agree. I didn't particularly like it. Um, it's really bad. I did think though, like it's from a book, and yeah, I do think I reckon the book is pretty good. Oh no, the concept, like the idea yeah. of it, is really fun. Yeah, but 
they they the writing for the movie is is absolutely terrible. And it's clearly from a book, and they've had to cut a lot out. Yeah, I think I started watching it. Yeah. But and Hugo Weaving was fine in that. I thought, he could have come back for the Matrix, but I guess he's, yeah. he's done with it. So I, I, yeah, I will watch it eventually. But um, maybe maybe you should, and maybe actually, as you've watched the first three, you could watch it now and you'd get something out of it. Bear in mind, I I hadn't seen them in a while, so yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll get it up on Netflix at some point. Yeah. Anyway, so back yeah. to Summer of Cup. Yes, a uh, inevitable question. Yeah, what would you do about them? It's hard because it's, it is. it's like. Bear in mind, like I say, the so bad they're good can really only get six. It's the highest. So then, on the so bad it's good rating scale, mm-hmm. because I did enjoy it. Uh, I think it's a four out of ten. Four. Okay, I'd go five. Yeah. All right. Well, we're not going to fall out over that difference. I've got to fight. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it was okay. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I don't think it's one I'll be rushing back to. Yeah. And I agree with you. I think Troll 2 is more fun. That's a six. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, this one is not really the same, but the last So Bad That's Good that I gave a four out of uh, ten to was um, Bram Stoker's Legend of, Legend of the Mummy 2. Yes. Otherwise known as Ancient Evil Scream of the Mummy. It's just... Yeah. Yeah, and, um, that that film was um, dreadful, but I will admit, I kind of liked it. And that's where you, well, that's where I think I sit with this one. Yeah, it's dreadful, but I kind of liked it. You you liked it even a bit more than that, so that's good. Oh, good nostalgia. Yeah, fair. That's fair. That makes a difference. Well, anyway, I think that about brings an end to the episode. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me again. And join me next week when we shall be looking at Stargate. Children of the Gods. So, for reference, um, that's the pilot episode for um, for the Stargate series. So basically, uh, there was two episodes and they made it into a film. So that's what we'll be looking at. Um, so again, thank you very much for being on. Thanks for having me. Sorry if my stomach made any noise during this episode. <laughs> Apologies. We will see, I guess. Yeah. Um, our voice is going to sound really weird. Uh, yes. Yeah, so- <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so thank you everyone for, for listening. I hope you'll have a really good rest of your week and see you next time. Goodbye.